Hi and welcome back to Noble Green and we're starting our two-part look at South America with Chile. Vines were first brought to South America uh, in the 16th and 17th century, initially by missionaries and later settlers. And the first vines brought over were for religious purposes, for communion wine, um, and later more traditional varieties that we see these days. It wasn't until the late 19th century that the so-called noble grapes, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, were brought over by later settlers. Uh, some of the first grapes that were there were Pais, uh, called Mission in California, emphasising the religious background of some of these wines. Um, but after the noble or international varieties were planted, most of the rest of the world was devastated by phylloxera, which we've mentioned before. Uh, but this didn't happen in Chile for various reasons. Chile's quite isolated, it's surrounded by desert, most of their vineyards. Um, also, they have quite sandy soils and have, uh, they, or certainly used to have, a practice of flood irrigation, which also destroys the laos which lives on the grapevine roots. As a result of this, there was a boom in exports from Chile in the late 19th and early 20th centuries uh, to areas like France and Europe that didn't have much wine while they were replanting their own vineyards that were devastated at the time. After this, there was a period of stagnation, but in the 80s and 90s, uh, with political freedom in, in the country, there was a lot of investment from foreign winemakers, particularly the Rothschilds and the Torres family from Spain, both quite big names in the wine world who have lots of different projects all over the world. But Chile was one of the first areas that was really exploited by this foreign investment. A lot of the traditional methods that were used, things like the big sort of evergreen beach vats called Rauli, um, and the old practices of flood irrigation were phased out in favour of stainless steel fermentation vats, the use of French or American oak, um, temperature control, you know, proper vineyard canopy management and all of these modern practices to really streamline the wine industry and make wines that were suitable for export and domestic and consumption throughout the rest of Europe and America in particular. The replanting in the late 19th century still dominates the vineyards. There's a huge amount of Cabernet Sauvignon grown in Chile, it's by far the, the dominant grape, but there's also a lot of Merlot, Carmenere, which we'll come on to, an interesting variety, as well as the old varieties, Pais and Moscatel, these traditional pink skin varieties that were grown throughout South America, brought in by the Jesuit missionaries initially. Uh, these are still grown and still made into a lot of cheap jug wine that you'll find consumed domestically, but virtually none of it's exported, particularly to the UK. Also, after a major earthquake in 1939, there was also replanting with the French grape Carignan, and there's a lot of this old vine Carignan around as well, particularly in the south of the country. That's, we're starting to see some really interesting wines from this. Chile's signature grape is, of course, Carmenere. Um, it was initially thought that Chilean Merlot just tasted different, um, in the same way that Malbec, as we'll see in Argentina, is different from the Malbec from Cahors in France. Uh, the growers did know they had something different, but then they usually referred to it as late Merlot, because it ripens later than standard Merlot, up to three weeks later, which really should have been a clue that it was a different variety altogether. Um, they also called it Chilean Merlot, just to emphasise its uniqueness. Um, there was an ampelographer, which is just a, a word for a grape expert, Jean-Michel Boisco, um, who was touring the vineyards to help them sort of identify them and help with the replantings. And he was shown a Merlot vine and he immediately said, that's Carmenere because he recognised it, because there is still a little bit left in France. Um, it's still quite obscure even in France. Um, there was a small but significant amount in Bordeaux pre phylloxera but because of its habit of late ripening, it often didn't produce very good wine in France, so it was phased out and a lot of it just wasn't replanted. You will very occasionally see it in some Bordeaux's um, on the label, uh, and it's, people assume that it was imported from Chile, but in fact it's the other way around. Because of this late ripening, one of the problems with Carmenere is it can retain a slightly vegetal character if it's unripe, or if it's too ripe, it can be a little bit bland and just like a fruit bomb with no real interest or complexity to it. Um, Aurelio Montes, when he was experimenting with the grape early on, said it's, you know, some of the wines were more salad than wine, in his words, because of this really unpleasant leafy characteristic that you can get from the wine. Geographically, Chile is really long and thin, and the natural way you'd think of dividing it is north to south. But in fact, um, it's more usually divided from west to east, because there's the coastal region, the inland valleys and the Andes. Um, and the inland valleys are where most of the wines produce, and it has influence from the coast, sometimes protected by the dividing range, 
and the cool breezes that come down from the Andes, which are a huge spike in the middle, dividing Chile from Argentina. Um, and it's a really interesting geographical formation that affects the wine in both Chile and, as we'll see next time, in Argentina. At the extreme north of the country, there's some very high vineyards up to a thousand meters above sea level uh, near the Atacama Desert, so quite a dry area. Some interesting wines produced here, but most of the vineyards are a bit further south in the central valleys. Further south, near the capital Santiago, there's the more established regions, Elqui Valley, which is where a lot of the grapes for Pisco, the local grape spirit, are grown. The second area near Santiago is Limery Valley. Uh, this is a, still a very much a coastal climate area. Um, there's less mountainous protection to the west, uh, so there's Pacific breezes, and particularly the Humboldt current, which comes up from the Arctic in a similar way that we saw in Western Australia and New Zealand, affecting the climate of the area. It keeps it nice and cool, uh, so it produces some really nice cool climate wines from Chardonnay, and this example from Tabali, a Viognier. So we'll give our first wine a taste now. So on the nose you've got a lovely peach character. It's very typical of Viognier from wherever it's from. This, it's not that pronounced, it's a very light, elegant wine which emphasises the cool climate in this area. Again on the palate you've got that lovely white peach flavour. A little bit of peach skin, there's a little bit of texture there as well. It's a lovely wine on its own, or this would work really well with whitefish, any kind of whitefish dish, lobster on the barbecue, it's got a little bit of meatiness there that means it can stand up to some really quite strong flavours. Moving further south, we have the Aconcagua region, uh, which comprises Aconcagua itself, which is relatively warm, and it's a good source of Bordeaux-inspired reds, those Cabernets, Merlots and so forth that were planted quite widely. Um, and also Casablanca Valley, which is a name you might be familiar with. It's, you see it quite commonly on labels over here, which produces some really nice Sauvignon Blancs, Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs, all, all grapes that prefer a slightly cooler, damper climate, which you have in Casablanca. Aconcagua and Casablanca were mostly planted in the 1990s. It's a, a fairly recent wine growing region. Grapes were always grown here, but these new plantings are still relatively young in terms of the wine world as a whole. Um, the standout sub-region here is Leda Valley, which is where we're seeing some of the best wines from. It's a really superb area and worth seeking out wines from there. In the Central Valley region, among the names we're familiar with over here are Maipo. It's an area that's rather warmer and again more widely planted in the late 19th century, perhaps more due to its proximity to the capital than any sort of intrinsic quality in the area. You quite often find some areas that are historically significant are nearer to areas of large populations rather than them being planted because they are intrinsically good wine producing areas you know and a good example would be somewhere like Bordeaux which you know a lot of the estates were planted by aristocrats um, to get away from Paris. Further south and at a slightly higher elevation is Rappel. Uh, now Rappel itself includes the sub-regions of Cachapel and Colchagua which is a name that you may be familiar with if you like your Chilean wine. Uh, here we have an example of Chile's signature grape Carmenere from Colchagua Valley. Um, and we'll give this a taste now. So the wine's got a lovely mid to deep colour, uh, so it's obviously got good extraction during its fermentation. It's got a lovely purity of fruit. There's a little bit of that red pepper coming through, which is typical of the grape. It's It smells rather like Merlot. It's got that lovely plum and damson character, but there's also that it is a vegetal aroma, but when it's red pepper, it implies it's ripe rather than green pepper, which can be slightly astringent and indicates underripeness. Now, there's a lovely ripeness of fruit here as well. It's a dry wine, but there's a little sweetness on the finish, which isn't residual sugar. It's just that, that lovely ripeness that you get from the, the lovely long summers and the cool nights. It's got a tiny little bit of tannins on the finish, quite powdery, which means it would work really well with food. But one of the things Carmenere is really good for, and there was actually a campaign run by Wines of Chile a few years back, is curry. Not all curries, but if you think of a lamb curry, very few reds can stand up to that spiciness, and particularly chili, whereas this can, I believe. And although it has lovely 
extraction. It's not over extracted, it's not jammy, it's not overly fruity. There's no discernible element of oak here that I can get, but it's it's lovely to see a wine of its place. This is this could only really be from Chile. It's got that lovely fruitiness, but also the acidity and the balance. As well as curry, this would work really well with roast gammon, for example. Really nice wine. <coughs> Curacao is the next region further down. Uh, it's got high rainfall, less influence from the ocean. The dividing range to the west is a little higher here, so there's much more shelter, but you do get the cool breezes coming down from the Andes, um, but there's slightly higher rainfall as well. Moving further south again, we come to Malé, Chile's oldest area under vine. Uh, there's some of the usual suspects here, Merlot, Cabernet, Carmenere, but also they're rediscovering some of the superb old vine Carignan and Pais, uh, which are yielding some really interesting wines. Uh, the Carignan was largely replanted in the late 30s um, and is now considered old vine, being 70 odd years old. And obviously older vines, as we mentioned before, produces some of the best fruit. Some of these vines are grown in quite an interesting way, sort of up into trees, so you see people having to sort of climb up to pick the grapes. This is really more by accident than design, but it really suits the grapes. It actually keeps them quite well aerated, slightly sheltered from the, uh, the sun as well, up there in the trees. There is a broad coalition of growers called Vigna or Vigna Doris de Carignan, and one of the prominent producers is the Garage Wine Company. They primarily started, because some of these farmers of this old dry farmed Carignan weren't getting very much for their grapes, but they were actually producing some really fantastic fruit that wasn't really being utilised in the best way. So we're now starting to see some really fantastic wines coming out of this broad coalition of vineyard, uh, mostly Carignan, but also some interesting things coming from Pais as well. When I say dry farmed, it mean, just means no irrigation. There's actually 10 times the rainfall down here than there is in the areas further north in Chile. Um, but it's still relatively dry, probably similar to Bordeaux in terms of pre precipitation. Um, and this produces some really lovely concentrated fruit from these old vines. Because the, the vines go down so far, the roots get, penetrate up to about 40 metres uh, with vines of this age. It means they're more stable, they're more able to weather out periods of rainfall and dryness uh, more evenly than younger vines are. From Cacenes, right in the centre of Malé, we have this example of Pais from the Garage Wine Company. Um, it's a relatively light wine. Previously, the winemakers would try and fit it into the mould of French wine. They would try and over-extract, oak-age it, and it really doesn't suit the grape that well. If, if you think that most of this wine is actually produced as almost a rosé, a very light jug wine, treating it that way doesn't really suit it. It's now more commonly treated more like Pinot Noir with minimal extraction and a lightness of touch. So if we move on to our last wine and give that a taste now. You can see if you sort of hold it up to your hand or against a white background, it's noticeably lighter in colour than the Carmenere, which itself isn't particularly deeply coloured compared to, for example, a Syrah. But it has a lovely lightness. So on the nose, there's a hint of strawberry, raspberry. Quite light, very fragrant. And on the palate again you've got that lovely light berry fruit, a little bit like a berry compote, a little bit of creaminess coming through, possibly from malolactic fermentation. I don't know if they've done that here, but it does taste a little bit like it, which just gives it that slight creaminess on the finish. A little bit of tannin, little dusty tannins, which, and a little bit of grip from the acidity. It'd be lovely with sort of light meat dishes, um, something like pheasant it would work really well with, or chicken. Um, it could also stand up to something a little bit stronger. Um, it could work really well with something like, for example, baked salmon with a red wine sauce, so with those slightly stronger flavours. It's got the acidity and the grip to handle that, but a very, very lovely little wine. Right down in the south, we've got the three main regions of Itata, Bio Bio and Maleco. Uh, being naturally cooler and wetter, these suit aromatic varieties really well. So you're seeing things like Gewürz, Tramina, Sauvignon, some Chardonnay and Pinot Noir uh, grown here. We're seeing a little bit of it in the UK market, not too much, but these areas are still being exploited and planted and they're trying to find the right sites but there's one or two wines starting to come through into the UK market. And next time we're going up and over the Andes and into Argentina. Salute!